like to welcome those who are joining us with our live stream. We welcome you wherever you are and are delighted to be worshiping with you. Um, our first song today is going to be My Savior's Love. <clears throat> Four flats. <laughs> Part of the pastor's role is to shepherd, which means to protect, and I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do that if I couldn't see out the windows. It's just a thing. It's me looking out for y'all. Sorry. Our scripture this morning is uh, out of John chapter 6. So they said to him, what sign are you going to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. 
Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone who comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. This is indeed the will of my Father, that all who see the Son and believe in him may have eternal life, and I will raise them up on that last day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you all glory and honor for your words. We thank you that you have spoken to us through your scripture and that we are able to hear exactly what it is you have said to us. We thank you for the many blessings you have poured out upon us this week. For the blessings that are blessings even though they didn't seem like blessings at the time. We thank you for each and every gift you have given us. We lift up the prayers of the people this morning. You have heard the cry for those who mourn, for the families that have been stripped of a beloved family member too soon, and there are too many this week. We seek your provision and your care for those who will be entering the time of spring break this week and next week and ongoing spring breaks. We know there are those who are traveling to and from college and those who will travel on trips over spring break and those who will just be on the road more than usual. And we seek your protection upon them. We ask for rest and sustenance for the teachers as they rest and prepare for the onslaught of the last two months of school. We continue to pray for our schools and all that are housed there, for the students, the teachers, the administration, and the caretakers of the property. We lift up our our police and our first responders, as always, and our military, for they give so freely of themselves on our behalf. We thank you that they show us this little bit of what you sacrificed. We pray for their families and their loved ones. We seek your forgiveness where we have sinned. We ask that you continue to open our eyes to areas in our life where we are falling short, where we are not putting you first, where we are asserting our will over yours. We ask that you forgive us and restore us to a right relationship with you. We know that you continue to love us even though we step out of your will or out of your desire. We ask that you bring us back in to your fold and keep us safe. This morning, Lord, we thank you for the happy sounds that are coming from the children's church area. As we sit here in quietness, we can hear the laughter of the children and the adults back there. And we thank you that our children are learning and that there is someone who has that call upon their life to teach them. We ask that you remain with us this morning and that you continue to find our worship sacrifice pleasing. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm hearing lots of extra giggles from back there this morning, which is always a happy sound. Did I make you hungry with the countdown video? The person making the bread, didn't that look good? Yummy? I meant to bring in a real loaf of yummy bread that I'd made following those instructions, but my Friday and Saturday got a little goofy. So it didn't happen. Otherwise, I'd be doing that thing that Rachel hates where I stand up here and I eat in front of you. (laughs) Drives Rachel crazy. Bread is yummy. 
My dad would rather have bread than dessert, and we all know about the sweet of the day thing. Good bread, not fake bread, you know what I mean? When you go to a restaurant that's a little on the nice side and they bring out the nice rolls and you fill up on the bread before the meal ever gets there, bread. Mm. And then we, we put ourselves on these diets because somebody told us bread is bad and we shouldn't eat the bread, the carbs, or the gluten. Or the something, we, 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 we do away with the bread. Most of our world lives on some form of a bread product. Why? Because it's fast energy and it's filling. And it's relatively cheap. And as Rachel is over here mouthing loudly, it's yummy. I mean, take their little girl. You stick a tortilla or a candy bar in front of her, and she wants the tortilla. The entire world's history has been based on a bread product. That is what people eat. That is what they fight over, is the ability to have more land to grow more bread, or the stuff that makes bread. Now, it's not all wheat. We here in America tend to be kind of a wheat-based society. Here in South Texas, because of the Native American and Hispanic influence, we do have a lot of corn that makes a bread-type product. There's also rice and barley. Depending on the part of the world you're in, your bread form might be predominantly a rice flour or a barley flour. Bread has created the structure of the modern day society worldwide. Any society you go to, any place around the world, and you're looking at food you have never seen before in your life, the bread is usually a safe bet. When I was a child, bread meant wonder white bread. I'm so glad we've gotten beyond that. It's still really good. It's so bad for you. It's not exactly what bread started out with. Um, also, when I was a child, you had your hot dog and your hamburger white buns. And you notice a few years ago when we had Harvey and everything was shut down and the HEB um, bakeries were putting out bread, what'd they put out? They put out white bread. Hamburger and hot dog buns. It's what they could churn out massive quantities of. They stopped making everything else and made hamburger, hot dog, and white bread. Kept us fed, didn't it? Until the varying uh, other places that made bread could get back online and get the trucks running. We lived for several weeks on HEB bread. Remember that? I do. Now... Nowadays, when you're going to go look for bread, there's quite a diversity. I mean, I no longer live in a small town in a rural area where the IGA that would probably fit inside of our church building existed. Okay, it was a little bit bigger than that. But, you know, maybe the produce section of our Super Kroger's now was our entire IGA in Beloit. You know, that was, that was big stuff. So when we go to the grocery store now, we have choices of wheat. Rye, sourdough, pumpernickel. Yes, there's a difference between rye and pumpernickel. If you think they're the same, we need to talk. Baguettes, boulet, sabata, which is a newbie. 1982 saw the invention of a new form of bread. Chala, brioche, flatbread, which would be your pita and your naan bread. Oh, love me some naan bread. Ooh, love me some naan bread. Tortillas, some are leavened, some are not. Some of those breads have a rising agent and some do not. Bagels, which are a boiled, not baked type of bread. And then we yuck all of them. We yuck them all up with butter, my first choice. Real butter, none of this margarine stuff. Butter, 
cream cheese, jelly, homemade and store-bought. I have a definite preference there. We ran out of homemade strawberry jam at home. And dad stopped putting jam on his. He will not touch the store-bought stuff after I've spoiled him with years of homemade strawberry. Guess what I'm making this spring? Strawberry jam. We put cream cheese. We put tomato sauce. Yes, we put tomato sauce on our bread. We call it, thank you, pizza. And then there's a variety of dips out there, right? There's all sorts of dips. You know, what is a tortilla chip? It's a tortilla that's been cut and fried. And now suddenly that opens up all the dips out there. Guacamole, I was thinking queso. Are we all hungry yet? Yeah, let's go. Okay, that's so. But there is nothing quite like fresh bread. Whatever variety of bread you want to eat, there is nothing quite like the really fresh bread. Even if it's just a rolled can of biscuits that you have, you know, opened the can, hopefully without exploding it, and put them in the oven and you're pulling them out and they're warm and flaky. There's nothing like bread. We are beginning our Lenten journey today. That is our journey of preparation for the torture, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's a great way to, you know, lose a crowd. We're going to talk about torture, death. The passage I read this morning comes on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water in the book of John. John's laid out a little differently than the other Gospels. But those passages of the feeding of the 5,000 and the walking on the water are one of the few stories that occur in all four Gospels. Makes them really important, doesn't it? But our focus for the next four weeks is going to be on the I am statements that follow those, that are unique to the book of John. Only John goes through these four I am statements that Jesus makes. Now the words I am are two of the smallest words in the English language. And yet they are powerful words. They shape reality. I am. If you said I am, what comes next? I am what? I am Robin, I am mother, I am grandmother, I am pastor, I am hungry, I am tired, I am confused, I am confident. They shape reality. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. It says a lot right there because I just told you in every culture, bread is the foundation of eating. If you don't think we live in a privileged culture where we have people that don't eat bread because of the gluten or the carbs or whatever, they live in a privileged enough world that they are not scrambling for that most basic of food. The bread. Now, people have been clamoring for Jesus to identify himself. From the moment he burst on the scene, they want him to tell them who he is. Who are you? Are you a prophet? Some people are trying to trap him into saying something that will get him into trouble. And some people are just genuinely curious. Who are you? But people have been clamoring for him to identify himself. Right after the feeding of the 5,000, John reports, John alone reports, that the crowd was ready to make Jesus king by force. 
They were going to, by a claim, make Jesus king and overthrow the existing government. Well, that's not why Jesus is here. So he slips away. We know that. But they were ready to force a showdown with Herod and the Romans because of this great miracle he provided. And so while everyone is running around still with the words and the miracle of Jesus feeding that many people out of little loaves and fishes, think about how much bread it takes to feed a crowd of over 5,000 people because that's 5,000 men. you got to add in the women and kids. How much bread is it going to take to feed one meal to everyone? Even if all you fed them was one hamburger bun, how many hamburger buns is that? That's a lot of hamburger buns. So on the heels of that miracle where people are talking still about the bread and the fishes, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. What does that mean? Well, the connotation there is, I am what sustains life. We aren't first century Jews, but if we were, we would have understood the cultural reference to bread and water here. The Jews regarded Moses as a type of Messiah, a savior, which he was, wasn't he? He came into their period of captivity. He led them away from the bad people. How many times have you just wished someone would swoop in and save you from the bad, whatever the bad was? So Moses comes in, swoops them out, takes them out into the wilderness to escape the Egyptians, and miraculously he manages to have God provide food and water. He is certainly a messiah. When the CIA is rescuing captives and they plan one of their, you know, super secret, we're going to go in and rescue you, they call him, the person who's going to do the rescuing, the delivering, they call him a messiah. That is his job, to go in and save the captives. Then we see the Israelites in the Moses story defy the laws of physics by the crossing of the Red Sea. They get fed miraculously the manna. Are we getting the feeling that we've just seen the Moses story reenacted by the feeding of the 5,000 miraculously? And so Jesus sends the disciples across the water, right, after the feeding of the 5,000. And we see Jesus walk on water that same day, that same night. And then they land on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And people have seen the boat go across and they go running around the sea. It's about seven miles. That's quite the hike. And they get there and they say, wait a minute, Jesus, we didn't see you get in the boat, but we see you get out of the boat. That's some pretty raising of eyebrow stuff. How did that happen? So Jesus is taking a cultural motif. The idea of bread being important to life and God providing life. And he says, I am the bread of life. He is making references that people will understand. When he starts talking about miracles and bread, these Jews have been schooled in the miracle of Moses and manna, of deliverance and bread. And they also know from their own existences that if they don't have bread, they're going to starve to death because that's the big filler. They don't have access to all these other foods that are going to fill them up. Those are the the specials, you know. The bread is what's filling them up. 
We don't have to look very far to see where Jesus is going to refer to himself as bread again. It's going to come up really soon. Does this sound familiar? This bread is my body broken for you. Where does that come from? Come on. Thank you. Now, the question is, what does that mean? And there are about as many answers to that question. What does it mean that he is, this bread is my body, broken for you? And there's about as many answers as there are denominations. And there's all those fancy words like transubstantiation, where the, the bread changes into the literal body of Christ. I'm working on that one. That sounds a little cannibalistic, you know, but whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm on board with that. Then there's consubstantiation, which Martin Luther said the bread exists alongside of the body of Christ. And then there's the uh, memorial interpretation, which was uh, this Reformation person that I can't pronounce, Zwingli. Which is more, it's more of a remembrance. When we eat the bread, we are remembering Christ. And then Calvin said, they are signs that we portray. We are lifted to the level of Christ. And all of that is just people trying to understand Jesus saying, I am the bread of life. You don't think the people at the Last Supper don't remember the 5,000 feeding, then Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, and now he is saying, this bread is my body. They're getting this idea that Jesus is vital to their continued existence. At this point, we are about two years into Jesus' ministry. About. About. And, it, you know, as the reader and 2,000 years later and we've been to second grade Sunday school and we've sat through a million sermons, we know that in about a year from this point, Jesus is going to die. We know that that is coming. But at the time, they don't know that. And they're caught up in the idea that bread is life. Jesus is going to use that. A lot. The idea of bread is life. So in about a year when he says, this bread is my body, they're going to remember all of this. They're going to build on it. Bread provides life for others. Keto diet notwithstanding here, bread is the main staple, right? Some form of bread. Did your mother give you bread so that she could stretch the main dish? Yes. You know, we're back to doing that because we got to stretch the grocery budget. Bread is cheap. Meat is not. We're starting to live a little bit more like the rest of the world who have looked at us for years and said, you guys have so much. Two-thirds, 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 two-thirds. How much did you put in your grocery cart this week? Two-thirds of that is made from rice, corn, wheat, barley, rye. And it's not just the sandwich bread we buy. You know, it's not just. I mean, there is corn or some derivative of corn in everything. Read the ingredients on your cereal. There's corn. Read the ingredients on your Coke can. There's corn syrup. Read the, I mean, anybody have an allergy to corn? You know exactly how much corn is in everything. Right? Anybody who's allergic to wheat knows exactly how much wheat is in everything. Every society has bread. This is, I keep saying that, but this is, this sells everywhere. 
When Jesus says, I am the bread of life, everybody understands. Everybody. Jesus provides life. Jesus is required for life-sustaining action. What? No, I don't need Jesus. I mean, it's nice to have Jesus, but I don't need Jesus. No, Jesus is saying, I am a requirement. And through his sacrifice, he's going to provide it. And here's the kicker. Have you ever needed to eat? I mean, we're sort of in this habit. We get trained at a young age to need to eat every two hours, and some of us never get over it. I need a snack. I'm hungry. But have you ever really needed to eat? Have you ever gotten to the point? I remember a day we were up here working on the church. It was after Alice in the Flood, and we were starving, and someone was supposed to bring hamburgers. And they got busy doing something else and forgot we were up here sweating and working hard. And someone finally called them about 1.30 and they were like, oh, I'm going to finish this up and then I'll bring you up there some food. And they got here with the burgers about 2.30 or 3. We had a massive work crew ready to gnaw each other's arms off. You know what I mean? We needed to eat. We needed it to survive. If we stopped eating, how long would we survive? Come on, John, you know this. You can live something like that. Uh, up, to, up to 40. You know, you can have so many minutes without air, so many days without water, and just a few weeks without food. And if you're really small, that number goes down. We need bread. We can fake it through part of our life without Jesus. We need the bread of life. We can fake it, but in the end, we're going to have needed him. And he tells us that. We need to be looking for people who need to eat who need the bread of life. Literally, let's look at how many people go hungry just in our city. We need to be feeding them. Yes, it is our responsibilities, first and foremost, as children of God, to feed the hungry because Jesus told us to. And then figuratively and spiritually, how many people out there need the bread that Christ offers. I promise you, every single kid in that sixth period class needed Jesus. How many people out there are spiritually starving and don't even know it? They have no clue because they've never been told. Now, remember that little tiny town I grew up in with the little tiny IGA? Pizza was, it was called Appian Way, and it came in a box. A little, like a little, it was made by the Jiffy company that made the little Jiffy blue boxes of cornbread. It's called Appian Way because, you know, the Appian Way is a street in Rome. Whatever. But a little packet of floury stuff, and you put some water in that, and you made a dough, and that was your pizza dough. And then there was this little can of tomato sauce that didn't even have basil or oregano in it. It was just a little tomato sauce. And you spread that over it. And then you browned some ground beef. And you put that on the little dough and the little saucy thing. And then, believe it or not, you cut up Velveeta and put that on top of the pizza. That was Appian Way, and that was the pizza we had in the little tiny town where I grew up. At least, that's what my mother interpreted pizza as. The first time after we moved to Texas, a friend of mine took and their parents took me somewhere and we stopped at Pizza Hut for pizza. 
And I looked at what they put in front of me and I said, where's the Velveeta? Do you remember the first time you tried something new and different and you decided it was the best stuff ever? Ever? I still like to find new stuff that is the best stuff ever. People are not going to know that they need Jesus until we give it to them. And then they're going to look at it and they're going to go, this is way better than the Velveeta I've been living. <clears throat> way better. Are we looking for them? Are we trying to share with them? Or are we just sort of locked up in our little houses trying to survive whatever it is is being thrown at us? Our takeaway here goes back to the beginning of Jesus' time on earth. His very first public preaching appearance when he does the Sermon on the Mount. And he teaches us to pray. And he says, give us this day our daily bread. Yes, these people are living a subsistence existence where they literally are working each day for money or product to survive that day. That day alone. Is there anybody here who would literally starve to death if you couldn't get to the grocery store today? No. We have food in our pantries. We have access to the grocery stores. We have change in a jar at home that we could buy something if our checking account suddenly didn't work anymore. But when Jesus says, give us us this day our daily bread, he is not specifically talking about, although predominantly talking about, enough to eat, to trust Jesus for today, for what our today's needs are. But if we think about it in the context of what happens two years and three years after that, when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, give us this day the Jesus we need. This day. If we call ourselves disciples of Jesus, okay, are we all followers of Jesus? If we are going to call ourselves followers of Jesus, we are ethically responsible to care for the needs of others. All the needs. If their tummy's rumbling, we're supposed to feed them. If their heart and their soul is rumbling, we need to be offering them Jesus because he is the bread of life. There is a world out there going hungry, literally. The food banks are crying for food because they can't feed the need. And then there's all the people that don't have access to the food banks. There are parts of our world where food banks do not exist. There are people who won't go to the food banks. There are people slipping through the cracks. There are moms and kids who have no way to, to even let their need be known. We are to feed a hungry world. And then we are to feed a hungry world. And they can't hear us until we feed them. Until we fill their bellies, they can't hear us when we say, I've got the bread of life for you. Like Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, I have water that will never run dry. And she's like, you mean I never have to come to the well? And he says, not exactly. We have a world that is hungry for what we have to give. And in the season of Lent, where we're looking at the place where Jesus gave it all, literally it all, because what else do we have to give besides our life? To stop breathing. 
What else do we have to give? He gave it all. Why is it too much to give to a world in need for us? What? What are we waiting for? Are we waiting for the right time, the right place? Are we waiting for it to land in our lap, some hungry person to show up on our doorstep and knock on the door and say, I need a dinner? We'd probably be so scared we'd slam the door in their face. I put a car on Facebook this week, and within 30 minutes, I had 435 inquiries. I know, I should have priced it higher. Um, but I put a car on Facebook Marketplace this week, had these 435, I could not get through them fast enough. I was still dealing with person one, two, and three on the list, and I had total strangers showing up in my driveway saying, I saw your car on Facebook Marketplace, and I looked it up on the map and started driving around until I found it. Scared me to death. I had little kids and dad running around in the front yard, and more than three people showed up, totally unannounced, that didn't even know my address, because I never put it out there. One person said, oh, I ran the blurred license plate through my AI thingy and figured out your license plate and looked it up on the DMV. Yeah. Don't tell me we wouldn't slam our doors on the people that showed up randomly and said, I'm hungry. So why are we not out there looking for the hungry people? <laughs> why are we not out there looking? Because it's not, there are people that have more than enough food on their table that still need the bread of life. What are we waiting for? What? In this season of Lent, when we are to contemplate the great sacrifice that Jesus gave, what are we waiting for? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for being the bread of life. We ask that you sustain us and care for us and empower us to take actual food and spiritual food to the masses who are hungry this Lenten season. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand as we sing, Break Thou the Bread of Life.
just a couple of announcements. Uh, you may text to give or give online. That is always the first announcement. Um, we've got devotions going online. Are we having prayer meeting on Tuesday? We haven't done it in several months, so I didn't know whether we were moving on. You tell me. Is everybody unbusy on Tuesday? Okay, we're having prayer meeting on Tuesday. I will try to send out a reminder. I will really try that, but I can't promise that. So Tuesday, um, I will have to send out the call-in stuff. Um, and then uh, don't forget God Science is coming up in June. The call right now is for shoeboxes. I need shoeboxes. So if you have shoeboxes, bring me your tired, your worn, and your weary shoeboxes. Lids too, please. Um, any other announcements that need to be made? Allow me to uh, pronounce the benediction. May we take and eat the bread that is broken for us and then share that bread with others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>